Welcome to Mr. Jennings' AP Biology. Today we're going to talk about other evolutionary forces. These are forces that are considered not natural selection. Darwin, when he came up with this theory of natural selection, he provided the mechanism to make evolution work. He had trouble explaining how it exactly worked with, in terms of genetics, but the mechanism worked. The problem was his mechanism didn't seem to be the only thing that worked because natural selection has some things that tend to spit in its face. Uh, organisms that are obviously not fit are reproducing. These traits are showing up all the time. We're going to talk about a couple of these here in a moment. But these are non-natural selective forces. Natural selection is a change in genetic frequency based on the most fit traits. The more fit you are, the more likely those traits are going to help you survive. And those traits that help you survive are going to accumulate in the population, thus becoming more abundant, being the driving force for evolution. Now, when we talk about non-natural selective forces, we need to talk about the first major one, and that is genetic drift. And this is the one that many students have difficulty discerning the difference between. So genetic drift is defined as a change in frequency due to chance. Natural selection is a selective force. It has direction. It is considered selective. Genetic drift is not since it's not selective and it's not adaptive, unlike natural selection. This here is completely random, so that's one thing you need to know. It is random. Also, something you need to know about genetic drift before we talk about the types of genetic drift is that it is has a greater effect in small populations. So in smaller populations, genetic drift is a much more dramatic force. On the screen right now is two forms of genetic drift. The first one being what we commonly call the founder effect. Now the founder effect is basically whenever a small population colonizes new territory. Okay, So in the founder effect, the population breaks off for some variety of reasons. Uh, the great example that we often use is the finch. Uh, the finch left the South America coast to find the Galapagos Islands. And as it goes through the Galapagos Islands, it colonized it. And it adapted and changed to the environment. But the fact what genes had available was limited to the individual that flew across. So while the on the mainland the variation between the original finch may have been dramatically different than those found on the island. So a small population will colonize a new territory. It's literally like the name applies. The founder is the genetic frequency. So you may want to note that is that the founder is the gene pool. So the gene pool goes from a dramatically different size, say this is our gene pool, and we have like a billion individuals, and it dramatically reduces to maybe a few hundred. So whatever traits were common in that one billion, say 50%, you know, 50, 50 percentage between the two different traits, and the hundred individuals, those are randomly picked. It could all be one trait. So let's say we had a billion black and white birds, all hundred I picked out could be all white. So that totally changes everything. So that is why the founder effect is so dramatic. It changes the gene pool based on the fact that it's random individuals selected out of the original population that left. Now the founder effect has a, something very similar, but it's not based on colonizing a new area. And that's the bottleneck effect. And the picture I have there helps explain this pretty dramatically. Uh, as you see here, this bottleneck has, in this bottle, there's many different colored marbles. And you see the ratio is probably really dominantly green. But as they try to pour through the bottle, they get constricted by the bottleneck. So some sort of event takes place here. And as they fall into the bucket, or this cup, the population has a totally different distribution. While green is very common in the bottle, the individuals in the cup, there's very few green compared to the rest of the population. And that's where the bottleneck effect happens. Some kind of natural event, say an earthquake, a tornado, even something as simple as a tree falling, causes a constriction in the environment. Uh, there could be an extinction, a plague, something that had indiscriminately selected the population. So the remaining, so the survivors are now the gene pool. And it's the same deal here as I showed here. So you have a billion cheetahs. Cheetahs is a great example of the bottleneck effect. A billion cheetahs. And cheetahs went through a couple of bottleneck events, namely being human predation. As humans selected against the cheetahs indiscriminately because we didn't have any preference, we constricted their population dramatically. So we went from a billion to, say, a hundred. That's not really the exact numbers, but let's use this for today. So those hundred remaining individuals are going to be very different. Now, the problem 
that really gets these effects exacerbated is this is now the gene selection. So if there's a hundred, let's go back to the black and white birds from the founder effect. If there's a hundred, hundred all white birds, the offspring are likely going to be all white. And this effect causes the gene frequency to change dramatically. We'll talk about how that actually works when we talk about Hardy Weinberg in a future video. But this is one of the more dramatic effects on a population. And the smaller it is, the greater the effect. Now another form of non-selective non pressure on evolution is gene flow. Now gene flow is a little harder to predict. Okay, so gene flow is a change in gene frequency due to immigration and emigration. So as individuals move back and forth between their population, let's say for instance we have this population of deer. They're separated by a mountain range. Well, these deer can go back and forth through a small pass in the mountains. The individuals are not intermingling that much. Only a few individuals can go back and forth. But because they can go back and forth, the genetic codes are allowed to flow back and forth. So gene flow means genes can move across these areas and they can move into new areas. So basically, a population can't become stagnant or homogenous. It allows some variation within that population. Uh, the problem with gene flow is it's often viewed as one, an equalizing force. And because of this, it's actually really hard to measure. Uh, you can run computer simulations, but you're at the mercy of individuals. And individuals have their own mind and their own free will, so it's kind of hard to predict. But there's many different programs out there that can run simulations, and you have to account for gene flow. Lastly, a major non-selective force in evolution is this thing called sexual selection. And this is the thing that probably puzzled Darwin the greatest. And that is a change in gene frequency due to mate preference. So genes are being changed not because of a natural disaster. It's getting changed due to what a mate thinks is nice. Mate determines fitness. So the mate thinks something is more fit than the other. So here we got the birds of paradise. They're found on a small island off, this, off the coast of Africa. As you can see here, they have elaborate coloration and dramatic displays and very pillowy feathers. And they have dances and courtship rituals. They are very complex. Do yourself a service and look up the birds of paradise mating rituals. They are crazy. These colors and these elaborate displays is what's going to attract a mate. A mate will determine an organism is fit based on how elaborate the colors are or how elaborate their dance is. So they think if this individual can live long enough looking this silly, they are probably very fit. Uh, they have very good genes. These big birds here, these crazy displays mean, hey, I am very fit. I have a lot of resources. I can access food greatly. Mate with me. Your offspring will be fantastic. So the females select these birds. What we need to know about sexual selection is it is selective. But it can be what we consider maladaptive. I'll put a little asterisk there, and that asterisk is possibly. I mean, the organism is still mating, so it is still at an advantage. But we take this bird here. This is what we call the widow bird. And as the name implies, you can probably figure out why it's called the widow bird. Uh, males don't typically live that long. Because the females have determined these large feathers you see here are indicative of how sexually fit this organism is. Problem is, uh, this large tail feather on a bird that's no bigger than your average crow is it makes it an easy target for predators. This is an example of maladaptive. And we know this is what females want because they tested birds. They took fake feathers and attached to the ends of these big uh, widow birds, and they got more mates. The problem is it eventually reaches the point where uh, no matter how much mates you're going to get, you can't live very long. So they do eventually die. This is considered this runaway sexual selection. It's like a sexual arm race. Now let's conclude here. Non-selective evolutionary forces. These are not natural selection. There's genetic drift, and that's a change in gene frequency due to random chance. Just organisms drift away. The two big examples are the founder effect and the bottleneck effect. They're very similar, but the way they come about is different. One bottleneck effect, for instance, due to some kind of an event. Founder effect is due to an organism colonizing a new land. Gene flow is a selective force, but it's actually very hard to measure. It does happen, though, because it's an immigration, immigration force. It allows the organisms to move back and forth between environments. Hard to measure, but it is an evolutionary force. Now, sexual selection is probably going to be the most dramatic because it directly relates to mating, and that is because it can be selective but also maladaptive. So it's a non-natural selection force, but it is very powerful. 
it is probably one of the most powerful reasons. So if you ever see an organism that looks goofy, chances are it's because of sex.